Fun little video today as our renovation draws to a close. I thought it would be a good time to show you all of our favourite products and lotions and potions and things that have just evolved over the years. This is our current kind of product set of things we use on a regular basis. Hiya folks, welcome back to the show. I've been wanting to make this one for a little while and if I don't make it soon, I'm gonna start running out of stuff and I'll not be able to show you all the stuff that we use. As per usual, this video is not sponsored. There are no product placements or anything like that. None of these manufacturers even know I'm making a video. More about that later on, but for now, let's get straight into this. This is our favorite kind of range of random products ranging from fillers to paints, glues, solvents and various other things that we just use more or less on a daily basis during a renovation or a building project. These do change from time to time but I do feel like we've kind of honed in on a product set that we're pretty happy with but obviously if the stuff that you prefer to use or you think some of the stuff that we're using isn't very good post it down in the comments below because it's always interesting you know a lot of this stuff I know about because of what you guys have told us so that's allowed us to kind of hone in on this. So just to give this video a little bit of structure, otherwise it'll end up being very, very random, we're gonna start off with some of the generic kind of products at the front here first. We're then gonna talk about paints a little bit and then we'll finish off talking about fillers and adhesives. And that will include telling you all about my absolute favorite grab adhesive and cork combination that I use for just about everything now. I've had a lot of problems with grab adhesives over the years and I finally found one that actually works. Anyway, starting at the front here, good old Brasso. Brasso is so handy, not just for a metal polish, but it works as a kind of general purpose polish. So you can get away with using that, you know, if you've got like maybe a mark on a bath or on a sink that just won't come off, sometimes because it's very, very slightly abrasive, Brasso will get that mark off. It almost works a little bit like a tea cut, so really handy product to have. I also use it sometimes on copper pipes just to make them look nice and shiny. Again, it's all these little finishing touches, very, very handy. I'm actually gonna try it on our old toilet seat, which is made of plastic, and we'll see if it takes some of the scratches out of it. As I say, almost using it like a, a polish. I'll report back on that if it works. Over at the back here, acetone. So handy to have a bottle of acetone to hand. This is just a uh, nail varnish remover, just bought in, that's a 600 mil thing off Amazon. And by the way, I will include links to everything down in the description. I finally updated my Amazon storefront after two years of it sitting there doing nothing. So if you can find it on Amazon, I will find a link so you can actually track these products down, but they're easy enough to find. But yeah, acetone, very handy. It's sometimes very useful for removing things like label residue, where you've taken the label off and it's left glue behind, and you just find that other less harsh solvents don't remove it. Acetone is kind of your last resort. You have to be a little bit careful because it can dissolve plastic, so do test it first. Be very careful. It's a very strong solvent. Also very handy for debonding super glue as well. So if you've got super glue on your fingers and it's annoying you, acetone should take that away. I also do keep a bottle of isopropyl alcohol around. I don't use this very often, to be honest, but there are situations maybe, you know, you've put a Sharpie mark on something and you can't get it off. Isopropyl sometimes works for that. I find it not quite as harsh as acetone. Again, with isopropyl and acetone, they evaporate very, very quickly. So you do have to work quick with them. Coffee's ready. Oh, thank you. Coffee's ready. I will be back in a second. For slightly less industrial grade solvents, white spirits, you just can't go wrong with white spirits. General purpose kind of solvent, handy for cleaning all sorts of things, cleaning oil-based paint off brushes, and just a general purpose kind of, if you've got something sticky, like leftover sticker residue, stuff like that, white spirits is generally my first port of call because it's very unlikely it's gonna damage the substrate, but normally it takes most sticky residues off and things like that. But as I say, 
if white spirit isn't cutting it you might have to go to something a little bit more aggressive but yeah white spirits very very handy to have around i'm not sure if you're supposed to but i sometimes use it if i need to dilute an oil based paint very slightly if it's just thickened up a little bit too much in the pot again white spirit seems to work for that and then methylated spirits so in the uk methylated spirits is normally purple but sometimes it's clear so if you're in a shop and you're looking for something purple and you can't find it it does exist in a clear form it's just normally it's purple anyway uh, this is i think denatured alcohol gets called in the states methylated spirits in the uk let me know in the comments what it gets called in your part of the world this is just a great general purpose degreaser so i tend to use this almost every time before applying silicon on any substrate it's really good around baths and basins and showers just to get any grime and grease off before you apply the silicon i'm sure it has many other uses as well obviously you can use it in camping stoves and things like that what have we got left here? Vinegar. Good old malt vinegar. If you've got a problem with lime scale around taps and around showers and on basins, any kind of lime scale problem, obviously vinegar is acidic and it generally dissolves the lime scale pretty quickly. But again, because obviously it is acidic, do a little test to make sure it's not going to damage the substrate that you're putting it on. But I've never run into a problem with it, ever. And it dissolves lime scale really, really well. And finally, it's not exactly a solvent, but it's a very handy thing to have around is silicon lubricant. So this is very, very different to silicon that you use around your baths and basins and all that sort of thing. This is a lubricating solution. It's very slippy, very slidey. You can get it in a spray or you can get it just in this normal kind of liquid format where you just pour it on. Again, I use this for all sorts of things, mainly for joining uh, push fit plumbing together, especially your big underground drainage pipes, almost essential for that. It's very difficult getting those pipes together if you don't pre-lubricate them. I've mentioned it before on previous videos. You have to be careful because it makes things so slippy and slidey that sometimes if there's any force going in the opposite direction on a joint it can make the joint fall apart oh you can also use it on things like curtain rails normally the spray type is better for that but anything where plastic is rubbing on plastic it's a great lubricant for that sort of stuff obviously there's also oils greases wd-40 all the usual culprits i'm not going into that on today's video anyway next up i'm going to talk about paints i'm not a big fan of really really expensive paint because in my experience after all the paint has settled down after six months or, or whatever and there's inevitable greasy handprints over everything and you know just general day-to-day -day wear and tear i cannot tell the difference between your cheaper emulsion paints and your more expensive emulsion paints. But if you want to go for the expensive emulsion paints, I'm not stopping you. I've used them in the past. They're lovely, they apply really nicely and all that sort of thing. It's just in terms of long-term maintenance, I've found very, very little difference. I am absolutely not a Dulux fanboy. We've had our fair share of problems with Dulux paints, but we just find like the custom mix it's readily available in lots of different shops. You can get exactly what color you want. We tend to do soft sheen everywhere as your final finished coat because it's not too shiny, but it can be cleaned quite easily. We also use uh, bathroom paint, but we've had problems with the bathroom paint not adhering very well to bare plastered walls, even if it's been miscoated and things like that. We'll come back to what you can do in that kind of situation, problematic paint. But other than that, we found like the... Dulux Trade or the Dulux, uh, whatever this is, the stuff that gets mixed in the shop, we find that generally works pretty well. You know, if I had to give it a mark out of 10, I would give it eight out of 10. The good news about the bathroom paint is that if you do get it to actually stick to the wall, it's really, really hard wearing and it is good for wiping down. And if you've got a damp environment such as a bathroom where you're probably gonna be giving the walls a wipe down every now and then, we have never ever had a problem with mold building up in a bathroom where we've used this bathroom paint. It's got the fungicide built into it and various other things. And as I say, it's generally very, very hard wearing. So for example, over here, this is gonna be the little splashback thing 
which is stuck to the bench, that we're using as part of the utility room, which I'm just now applying some of the final little trims and cover pieces and things like that. And we were debating tiling this, but I think all we're going to do for now is pop some bathroom paint on it and we'll see how it lasts. And at the point it starts wearing away, then we'll tile it. Again, I'll report back on that and tell you how long it lasts because it's going to be quite a good test for the longevity of the bathroom paint. But yeah, the main problem I've had with this is that sometimes it just doesn't stick to bare plastered walls, even if you've used a mist coat. I don't know why we've tried mist coat of contract matte and it just didn't stick to it very well at all. And we've tried watering down this paint itself and to be honest, it was better, but we still had problems with adhesion. But that neatly brings me on to two products that I do find kind of, well, three products I will show you. Two to kind of preempt the problem and one to resolve the problem if you haven't done this in the first place. So for painting on the bare plaster, we found the Screwfix bare plaster trade kind of primer matte finish you know what it is? It, it's actually really opaque. It works really well as just a bog standard emulsion paint, but it tends to stick to bare plaster much, much better. Never had a problem with it. It's actually quite thick. I think you can water it down a bit if you want. Have a look at the instructions anyway. We will never use contract matte as a mist coat ever again. We've had far too many problems with it. Moving forwards, we will only ever use this on bare plaster. And if that's not cutting it, for example, on shiny paint on walls that you might have to paint over for whatever reason, then honestly, I've never had a problem with Leyland acrylic primer undercoat. It just works for everything. Bare wood, problem substrates where you need to paint over shiny stuff, as I say. Anything where we're maybe changing the paint type, doing a quick coat of that in between, it just sticks to everything. And you can tell by, you know, if you get this onto something and you leave it for a couple of weeks, you try getting it back off. It just sticks so well. For example, for this piece of boxing over here, we've just painted this with the primer undercoat and then we'll just do the top coats of whatever afterwards. I know a lot of you will be asking, can you use this under oil-based paint? I have used it under oil-based paint and it's been absolutely fine, but generally speaking, if I know I'm gonna be putting oil-based paint over the top, then I'll normally use an, an oil-based primer undercoat such as the Santex. So on most of our external gloss work or external woodwork, this is what we've ended up using. It's got a 10 year, well, I don't know if it's 10 year guarantee. It is 10 year guarantee. So we do a base coat of that, and then we put whatever over the top of that. In some areas we're using an oil-based paint over the top, for example, on all the black gloss work on the house, and in some areas we're using a water-based top coat over the top. For example, the anthracite gray paint that we're using at the lower levels to match the windows, but this is what we've ended up using externally as the undercoat. And so far it's worked really, really well. I don't know if you're allowed to use water-based paint over the top of it. I don't really care. It works for us. If you don't want to do that, that's completely up to you. But generally speaking, for internal priming of bare wood, we use this, and for external priming of bare wood, we use this. It's interesting actually that this says for wood and plaster. I would be very intrigued to know the difference between this and this, because they seem very similar in terms of how well they stick to the substrate. This seems a little bit thicker and it's more expensive, but whether or not you could just get away with watering this down a little bit and it would do the same job as that, I don't know. Let us know in the comments if you've tried that. But obviously this stuff comes in much, much bigger pots, so it's more practical for big areas. For top coat white paint, we have completely switched to water-based. I've made videos about water-based paints many times over the years. We never use white oil-based paint these days. It just, it always turns yellow. You might have had experiences where oil-based paint doesn't turn yellow, that's fine, fill your boots, use oil-based white paint as much as you want. But you have to bear in mind that I've done work in thousands of houses, thousands of new builds, and I've seen so many places where oil-based white paint has started to yellow after only one or two years, if that. So it's just not worth the hassle. The downside of water-based paint is that it dries very, very quickly and it doesn't flow in the same way that oil-based paint does. You can put additives in, such as Floetrol, 
Again, we've never really tried that because we've just got used to working with it. I kind of forced this on Mrs. Mark a couple of years ago and she was a bit apprehensive about it, but now she absolutely swears by it. You just get used to working in a slightly different way. And because it dries so quickly, you can just do multiple layers. Don't try and get a perfect coat all in one go because it just won't happen. But if you do maybe two or three layers, you can do it so quickly. You can do that much, much quicker than you can with oil-based paint and you don't have all the fumes and waiting for it to dry and things like that. Not to mention all the benefits of cleanup. But anyway, what I was gonna say is that we used to use the gloss version of this, but the gloss version was always a little bit satiny anyway. It wasn't very shiny gloss paint. If you did want a shiny water-based gloss, well, there was a Johnstone's paint that we used, but you can't buy it now or I've struggled getting hold of it and to be honest that paint I've noticed was starting to turn yellow on the cap of the uh, paint pot even though it was water-based so I wonder if that's why it's been withdrawn slightly maybe it hasn't been withdrawn I'm just talking rubbish but my point is is that we've moved over to a satin based and then there's just no question over a gloss that doesn't look very glossy we're just going for a deliberate satin everywhere We've used satin on all of the woodwork internally in our renovation on this property. At no point has anyone walked into the house and said, oh, your skirting boards aren't very shiny. Not to mention that, but it's very, very hard wearing as well. We've got it on the banister and various other places where it's getting rubbed and bumped into every day. We've used it on our front door to paint our front door white. Again, keys rubbing up against it every day. No sign of wear and tear whatsoever. So generally very happy with that. And then finally, if you do run into a problem with paint not sticking to a particular substrate or you've painted something and the paint's starting to peel off, peel stop, this stuff's like magic. Again, I was a little bit apprehensive about it the first time I used it. This is made by Zinza, by the way. It's quite expensive, but it's worked in every situation we've needed it for so far. What it does is it soaks through the existing paint that's on the wall and it re-glues it to the wall. It's really quite clever. So if you've got any problems with powdery paint on the walls or paint that's starting to flake off the walls, obviously you need to get the paint off that flaking off if, if it's already kind of all peeled up you need to get all that kind of stuff off but we ended up using this in our bathroom and basically everywhere where we used the watered down contract mat as a mist coat and it didn't work very well and it was very powdery we've ended up using the peel stop and it completely sorted the substrate out ready for emulsion over the top. So yeah, really good problem solving paint that. Very handy to have kicking about. Give it a little test on an area, see if it's actually gonna work. But as I say, for every problem we've had, that has actually fixed it. Obviously there's a million other paints that we use, but this is kind of our core set now that we've honed in on and we're quite happy with it. So we'll quickly talk about fillers and then we'll talk about glues. So I still, I'm a big fan of two-part fillers and Deco Fill tends to be my go-to one that I use because you can buy it in various size pots depending on how much filling you're doing. Very, very hard wearing. It turns into a kind of plastic material but you have to work with it very, very quickly. So it's not great for large areas. It's not as easy to sand as traditional fillers but you can use it on pretty much anything. Uh, wood, metal, concrete as it says on the tin. The big, big advantage of a two-part filler is that it dries in 10 minutes or so, and you can then sand it down and paint over it. Whereas pretty much every other type of filler, you're looking at an overnight wait before you can sand it down. So if you need to just kind of get on with stuff and get a hole filled and painted and move on to your next job, this is the product I would personally use. You can also use like Ron Seal do fillers in various colors, like white and browns and general wood colors and stuff like that. It's never a particularly great match, so if you're painting over it, personally, I'll just use the uh, Deco Fill. This dries with a kind of grey colour, but yeah, dead easy to use. General rule of thumb, golf ball versus P, so that's roughly your ratio of filler to hardener. But you get used to it, you don't need very much hardener for it to harden quite quickly, but you have to work with it quickly. It doesn't crack. People have said like, oh, if you fill something with that, it's going to crack over time. It doesn't crack. I have never, ever seen two-part filler crack. But obviously, as I say, this is just my experience. If you want to use something else, 
go for it. For areas where you just can't be bothered mixing up a two part filler, I use twiglets, as you can see. So this is um, Easy Fill 60. So Easy Fill 60 is my go to filler for pretty much everything jointing, random bits of plastering. It comes in quite big bags, so I decant it into a little pot and you can just mix up as much as you want of it. Sands very, very easily, but the problem with Easy Fill is that it's not very hard wearing. It's not very strong. For example, if a corner has chipped out of a piece of wood, if you use Easy Fill to fix that and you knock it, it's just gonna fall out. It's, it's not strong enough for that. You really need like a, a two part filler for those sort of repairs. But for just general purpose, little holes in walls and stuff like that, Easy Fill works really well. Works even better if you keep it in a twiglet pot. As per usual, there are many other fillers that I use, but that is the two day to day ones that seem to do the job for 99% of things. Then adhesives. We'll go for wood adhesive first. I still use Type Bond 2 and I decant it. I buy it in massive bottles and I decant it into a slightly smaller bottle. There's the bigger bottles there. It's not officially waterproof, so for outdoor products, you should probably use Type Bond 3 or some other type of wood adhesive. There's all the fancy ones that foam up and things. I've never used those very much. I probably should, but um, yeah, I find Type Bond 2. If you have two bits of wood, clamp them together, leave it overnight for the glue to go off, you will not get that joint apart without breaking the wood. So as a general purpose wood glue, I do like that. Then for smaller joints, mitre joints, anything like that, CA glue is your friend. Mitre bond, super glue, it's all effectively the same stuff. If you've got two bits of wood to join together and they're only small, Try super glue, it's amazing. Super glue on wood works really, really well. And if you use the activator spray, which I've run out of activator, I always run out of the activator before I run out of the glue. But anyway, if you use the activator spray, it makes it set pretty much instantly. So generally what you do is you put the super glue on one side of the joint, you spray the activator on the other side of the joint, join the two together, hold it for about 10 seconds, and again, forms a very, very strong joint. The only problem with mitre bond is if it oozes out of the joint, it's quite difficult to sand down. It's almost kind of a plastic consistency. So avoid it oozing out of the joints if possible, but as a general purpose, glue for small areas, mitre bond or CA glue or super glue with activator spray is just amazing. Then this stuff, spray glue, this is really handy to have around. I use this mainly for gluing bits of sandpaper onto bits of wood. We've talked about this in the past, but if you're doing scribed joints on skirting boards, all I've done here is I've glued, you can see it's coming off a little bit at the top. It's not as strong as the other glues that we've talked about. So what I could do there is I could just run a little bead of super glue across the top there to stick that back on. But anyway, for the flat areas of this, that is a piece of sandpaper glued onto a piece of skirting board just using the spray glue. And then you can use this to sand the edge of a, an adjoining piece of skirting board and you'll get a perfect match between the two. I've talked about that in other videos. I'll include a link down in the description below so you know what I'm talking about. But yeah, spray glue, really, really handy for that. This video wouldn't be complete without talking about a general purpose um, kind of construction adhesive and silicons as well. I'm still using 785, Dow 785 for bacteria resistant silicons. So bathrooms and around basins and toilets and showers and all that sort of thing. There are probably better ones on the market now. Let us know in the comments below. I just buy it by default because it tends to be what's always in and it works better than your unbranded silicons. So if you're having a problem with silicon always going moldy, try the Dow stuff, but also check in the comments below because I'm sure people will recommend stuff that never ever goes moldy. And there are a few tricks that you can do to stop your silicon going moldy. We'll maybe cover that in a future video. So don't forget to hit subscribe. And just in terms of a general purpose, grab adhesive type stuff. Um, I find the pseudo fix all works fine, very sticky. So for skirting boards and things like that, where maybe it has to stick to a problematic substrate, then you might find something like that works quite well. I don't use it very often because it's pretty expensive. My go-to 
grab adhesive for stuff that needs to stick really well and it needs to stick to problematic substrates is pink grip. In the UK there's kind of grip fill and pink grip are probably your main ones but I find the grip fill skins far too quickly and by the time you've actually put the glue on whatever you're going to be gluing it's skinned and you need to kind of smear it in when you attach the thing to the wall otherwise it doesn't break the skin and it just doesn't stick. Pink grip I find doesn't skin quite as quickly. It still skins so for big things I find that doesn't really work very well because by the time you've put the glue on from one end to another, for example on a really big piece of skirting board, you'll find that the bit that you started has already skinned and therefore it doesn't stick very well. But for smaller pieces it does grip very very well once this is dried. This comes in the bigger tubes, so 350ml versus 300, 310, 290 or whatever for your normal silicon gun applicator. So you're going to have to make sure you've got a gun that can handle the bigger tubes. And also it tends to be a little bit harder to squeeze down the tube. So I find this particular gun works really well with these because the ratio of how hard you have to squeeze it for stuff to actually come out the end works pretty well. You can seal it up after you've used it, but generally speaking, because it is solvent based, it's going to go off pretty quickly. So try and use it all up in one go if you can. But as a general purpose, really strong solvent based adhesive, I find the pink grip works pretty well, but I'm going to save my favorite adhesive until last. And that's the one that I use for almost everything. I don't use this very often, but we'll talk about corks first. We've talked about corks in other videos where I've done full tests on different corks, but you know what it is? I always just come back to bog standard, screw fixer's own, no nonsense, decorator's cork. It's cheap as chips. I think it's about two quid a tube or something like that. I find there's no discernible difference between that and the ones where you're paying sometimes eight or nine pound a tube for. But you know, if you want to spend eight or nine pound a tube on cork, Bear in mind, I dread to think how much cork we've got through on this renovation, probably 50 tubes or something, I'm not sure. So it all adds up. Cork, by the way, it's a flexible filler that comes out of a, a tube with a little nozzle on the end. So for things like around skirting boards and architraves and anything where you've got two different materials that are gonna be expanding and contracting at a different rate, if you don't use a flexible filler, it will crack over time. So the whole idea of Decorator's Cork is that it's got a slight flex to it. It's water-based, so you can smear it in with your finger, wipe it off with a cloth if you've got too much of it. You can't really sand it down, so it's not ideal for cracks on walls. But if you do have a crack on a wall that just won't go away, I have seen situations where cork can actually work quite well. As I say, just bear in mind, you can't really sand it down, but it's not designed for that. It's designed for gaps between skirting boards, architraves, all that sort of stuff. If you've got a different cork you like to use, let us know down in the comments below. I'll not pay any attention to it, I'll just keep using that. And then finally, I know I've kept you hanging on for this one, but this is my favorite grab adhesive that I've ever used. I'm really, really impressed with it. If you're not familiar, earlier on in this project, I used some, uh, I think it was just the Screwfix's own non-solvent based grab adhesive for putting skirting boards on the wall and they all fell off. It was just useless. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say it might have been because of the dodgy miscoat paint on the walls that was a little bit powdery, but I haven't had that problem with other adhesives, put it that way. Obviously you can go for things like your fix-all and your sticks-like adhesives, but they're very, very expensive. If you're doing like a full house, 10 quid a tube for one of these and you've got like however many linear meters of skirting board to attach to the wall, it's not really practical. But my new favorite grab adhesive of all time is it's the Everbuild Instant Nails. I just buy it from Tool Station. It's two or three quid a tube. I'm not sure if it's solvent based or water based, to be honest. It, it feels like it's solvent based, but I don't think it is. Either way, it's really, really sticky. It doesn't skin really quickly like your pink grips and your grip fills. So you can use it on really long pieces of skirting board without any problems. As I say, it, it behaves much more like, your, well, this is a clear, uh, one, it's probably a bad example, but it, it behaves much more like your sticks-like adhesive, but it's a third of the price. 
And as I say, so far, I haven't had any problems with it. Everything stayed attached to the thing that it was supposed to stay attached to, which is a good thing for glue. Let's see what it says. Does it say it's solvent based? It says it's overpaintable, multi-use, adhesive, high strength, quick grab, gap filling. That's another thing that this is really useful for because sometimes when you're filling things that you need to be filled with cork, cork, as we've talked about in previous videos, cork shrinks when it dries and there's pros and cons to that because it means that if you put too much cork on, you don't really need to worry too much because it'll sink down into the joint a little bit as it dries anyway. So you don't get too much of that kind of U shape along the joint with cork. You'll know what I mean if you've used it. But as I say, for big gaps, cork doesn't work for that reason. It shrinks too much. It just doesn't work as a big gap filler. It's only for gaps that are probably, I would say up to two or three millimeters, I would use cork. Anything more than that, even then, you'll see the cork sink down into the joint on a three millimeter gap. So what I do is I glue the thing to the wall and then I go around and any big gaps, for example, if the wall's not particularly flat, any big gaps I fill with the instant nails. And then the next day, once everything's dried, I then go over the top with cork just to give you a flexible kind of joint on the top level. I think this, once it dries, it's not very flexible. So I don't know if you could get away with this being your top level filler instead of cork. I think you would probably get some cracking over time. Don't know, I would have to do some tests. Either way, for general purpose, corking, and as I say, filling gaps around skirting boards and all that sort of thing, this is much nicer to work with because this is very sticky. It sticks to everything and it doesn't come off your hands as easily as normal cork does. But as I say, as a general kind of combo product set, I've really settled on the instant nails for attaching the stuff to the wall and back filling and the cork for your final level filling prior to painting. And by the way, yes, on my previous video where I did the cork test, I made the fatal mistake of not priming the wood first, but to be fair, it was quite a good test for the products to see if it can handle going on a non-primed wood. I do generally prefer to always prime the wood before using the cork, otherwise the moisture gets sucked out of the cork too quickly. So it's good to put it onto a substrate that's already kind of sealed. So my order of operations is to glue everything to the walls, backfill, prime everything, and then do the corking. Sometimes I'll then prime over the top of the dry cork, depending on how ugly it's looking. And then you do your top coats of whatever, uh, like satin paint or whatever you want to use on top. So folks, I hope you found that useful. As I say, this video is not sponsored. I have never made a sponsored video on this channel. And that's all thanks to the fact that you guys support the channel on things like the member zone and on Patreon and stuff like that. As I say, this is just kind of our current set of products that we like to use. I'm sure it'll evolve over time because we learn a huge amount from the comments that you leave down below. So please do argue about everything I've said in this video, if there's products that you prefer to use or if there's products that I've used that you think are rubbish, please let us know. But as I say, this is pretty much what we've honed in on over 10 or 20 years of doing renovations. One other way you can support the channel is to use links to the products that I've talked about, which I'll include a link in the description to my Amazon storefront, which I've finally updated. I'll make sure as much of this as possible is on there. I'm not like the biggest fan of Amazon, but I have approached like your screw fix and tool station and stuff like that to try and get them to do affiliate links, but they're just not interested. So stuff it, um, Amazon it is for now, until these other companies sort out their affiliate platforms. As I say, the video is not sponsored, but I'm not gonna recommend products completely for free when these companies are making, you know, millions or billions of pounds a year in profits. So I think it's only fair that I get a little bit of a kickback and by doing it through the affiliate thing, it's completely fair because I don't get anything unless you actually buy something. And obviously it doesn't cost you a penny extra either. So there's a link down to the Amazon store in the description below. 
And what I've also done is I've tried to break down almost every product that we've used for this renovation where we bought the product off Amazon and we bought a lot of stuff off Amazon by the way. So a lot of your kind of niche little building products like your kind of your fire collars, bizarre jubilee clips and fixings and fittings and all this sort of stuff. If you're wondering what we've used, it's all linked to from the Amazon store. So head over there and see what you can find. Hopefully you'll find it useful. I think we'll leave it there for today. Do hit subscribe. Next time we'll be going back to our utility room and downstairs toilet project. Get that one wrapped up and then there's a whole load of other stuff planned for you that I hope you'll find useful. For now folks, as per usual, look after each other, be nice to each other and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.